Hello everyone. This is part four of my interview with former Scientologist and ex-Sea Org member Robin Capella. In this episode, we pick up with Robin being transferred from San Jose to the Los Angeles Church of Scientology in 1992. That may seem like a long time ago, but believe me when I tell you that very little has changed with how Scientology has run since then. We're going to get into some pretty grim details in this episode about what life is really like in the Sea Org and what happens out of the eye of the public, including how pregnant Sea Org members are actually treated before they're kicked to the curb. Before we do, I need to explain one thing. Robin was transferred to the Los Angeles Org, which is not like any other local Scientology organization. Not only is it in the heart of Los Angeles, where Scientology's international management is only a few miles away, but L. Ron Hubbard also named the LA organization as the model Scientology church for the world, meaning it was supposed to be a showpiece and training ground for all Scientology staff in the world. The idea was that Scientology church staff and executives in training would go to the model org and there they would learn exactly how to follow Hubbard's closely taped policies and then go back to their location and create the same kind of thriving and expanding scene as Los Angeles. The only problem with this, of course, is that Hubbard's policies don't work. So LA org has been a disaster since the day it opened all the way back in the 1950s. Because Scientology management is so badly run, and because LA has never been a model to emulate, there are no successful Scientology churches anywhere in the world. In this video, we go into some detail about the unusual ways that LA org staff and management have dealt with that problem. Robin's job was called the flag representative, or flag rep, which meant she was supposed to be management's eyes and ears to get things done with the staff and executives directly. Flag reps get direction via telexes and dispatches, but in the case of LA Org, management staff can also just cross the street and walk right into the place, even though they aren't supposed to. So let's see how things went for her in this model Scientology organization. Here is part four. Okay, so you go from there to LA. Now, why yeah. was LA such a, you know, steaming flap? What, what was making it that way? Well, it just, I don't think it ever was not a steaming flap. I see. Always was a problem. Again, they didn't have the flag reps. They needed to have a flag rep because it's the model org. So okay. go in there, and I remember the, the lady who ran this org was Jeannie Sonnenfeld. Okay. And she really ran it, and it was her org. And she made that very clear. And she formed yeah, Click. She was a Sea Org member. She was a Sea Org member, and she was the she she was sent to run that org because it was you know such a disaster, <laughs> you know. <clears throat> yeah, the, yeah. The org was always a disaster. It was always a problem. There were there there was a lot of pressure on that org to always have better and higher stats. And what would occur is they would falsify wholesale. And that's what Jeannie was doing, actually. She was falsifying stats, and the people under her were falsifying stats just at, at huge levels, like huge amounts. And I started finding this out. And uh, she, you know, she didn't like it because I was poking around. Um, and there was, yeah, so, but she ran the org like herself, and it was, you know, she was, again, she was very focused on GI. And she had her little clicks, and it was very clear who her favorites were and who she didn't like. And um, when she was finally busted off post, the org was given um, a stats amnesty, basically, where they were told, "Okay, let's just report. We know we know things are false. Let's just report where they currently are, just so we know where we're working with. You're not going to be in trouble. We're just we just want to see." And I think everybody but me was shocked at how, in management, was shocked at how huge the drop was. I think I can, you know, say uh, it was it was tremendous. All the stats, almost all of them, were being falsified by double, triple, quadruple, all of them, every single one. So, yeah. for example, one of the stats yeah. is well done auditing hours, which is how many hours right. counseling is going on. Yeah. Well, I'd have to say that one was probably not being falsified too much. The big difference, because 
you know, those guys knew how many hours they did. Mm -hmm. the, the big thing there was they were auditing into foundation hours. So a lot of the stuff they were doing, a lot of the production they were doing was actually not on their time. It was on foundation time. Okay. Um, so that was quite a bit of the production because a lot of the auditors were coming in and work at night, but they were supposed to be LA day staff. So it's a, you know, splitting hairs, but it was the thing. Oh, yeah. no, that's not splitting hairs. That's totally off the rails. Yeah. So, <laughs> okay. so hey, you're, you're, know, be, because yeah. by definition, and, and it, Again, I love that we're talking about this because this is the mindset that Scientology staff yeah. are pushed into mm -hmm. is the statistics rule their life yes. to, to the degree that here you have an org called Los Angeles Day. Mm -hmm. That organization is supposed to run from 9 to 6, Monday through Friday, and that's its production time. Yep. Yet, people are available for auditing during the evenings and weekends more often than they're available during the day because people work during the day. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So let's take the LA day auditors mm -hmm. and let's have them audit at night. Yeah. Yeah. I never understood why foundation was always so tiny compared to LA day. And it really was because LA day was pushing closed. them out of business. They were, they were just pushing completely. And, one of the one of the biggest schemes that she had going was someone would do their their uh, training up through the level of class five auditor or class four auditor, right? Mm -hmm. They would train through that, and then they would have to go to the qualifications division to do tests and get certified. And they would have to do, you know, they'd be tested, and they would get what was called a retread or a retrain, depending upon how badly they did, right, on their little review, and they would count when they were doing the retreads or retrain for each level as a full course completion. Right. At every point from, from all the different stats that that applies to. And it was a huge amount of them because everybody would have to do those. And it, it sort of behooved them to have students do poorly on those tests because they would get such better. They would get so many points when really quick too. Right. Right. Which, uh, which again, very important point and a very good one, yeah. which is that the whole purpose for the organization and what it's trying to accomplish or what it's supposed to be accomplishing actually gets pushed totally off the cliff because of the statistical pressure to have a graph on a wall going up, measuring something that isn't even true and isn't even a valid reflection of what the organization is supposed to be doing but because of the pressure brought to bear yep. that is more important than what they're actually doing in the real world yeah absolutely and there were very few new people coming in um books sold very low not many public doing you know basic courses and stuff that were not already scientologists one of the biggest sources of um, new courses and public and and um, what were called publics, you know, new publics were um, kids, little kids. So they would get kids from the different schools to come over and do do courses. But they also did, ran this thing where they did seminars. So they would go and get people in for a half an hour seminar that was paid like five dollars, and count those as full course completions, fully. Of course they did. That was done a lot, and that was a huge amount, and. When I when I would confront someone about it, it would be, I would just get these blank looks because they had no other they had no way out of this trap, you know. Mm -hmm. it, the, the pressure that was brought to bear at LA Day was was intense. Even CMO would come over and yell at everybody. I mean, it was just, you know it wasn't it was always constant. And LA Day was supposed to be the model org for all other orgs, and so there had to be this appearance that it was big and doing well, and it really 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 was not <clears throat> and one can only wonder now this was all in 1992 this was 92 93 right yeah, it was right around there so this is right this is just a bit before the la day first achieved you know this magnanimous amazing thing in scientology called saint hill size right, right. where the org is supposed to be huge and abundant and everything's right. great and you can see the truth of that is totally opposite to, you know, right. true yeah. expansion or that they're, they're really not doing good. They're really not viable. They're not making money. No. And they certainly can't do it on their own. Yeah. yeah. And they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. 
Now, this is only, I bring this up because that was going on then. Yeah. Now, they, 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 they're so desperate in the last year or two they, that they fill this org with C organization members mm -hmm. and kick off all the regular staff. And mm -hmm. now it's all just a bunch of C org members in there. Right. You really think it's any different right now? I absolutely know it's not. It's not different because the, what happens is there's just people, people aren't coming into course, new people aren't coming in and staying in. So there's just, there's only a certain well to pull from and the pressure is still there. I mean, what happened, how LA Day first went St. Hillside back in the 90s, in 96, I believe it was, 90, I think it was 95 actually. John Woodruff came in to replace Jeannie Sonnenfeld, and we don't need to, I think that's been discussed at length, his whole thing of coming in, but yeah. with him came literally the entire it management structure. WDC, Watchdog Committee member for Scientology came into the org. COCMO Int came into the org. Almost oh, every yeah. single one of the Int execs, like GI exec Int, uh, marketing exec Int, everybody was in so this So this is back in the day when all these people were still actually on post. Yes. That yes. Ms. Savage hadn't, hadn't ransacked right. management and put everybody in the hole and, and you know. Yeah, this was in, yeah, this was in 95. So yeah, so these people were actually still around at this time. Right. Still have some appearance of doing their job and Miscavige is probably, you know, yelling at them up at Hemet, but they yeah. come down to LA to put this fantastic new executive director on post right. on Woodruff because Jeannie had, you know, you went in there, showed all the false reports. Jeannie gets busted. Yeah. She's disgraced. Yeah. And they're going to handle the hell out of this man. Yeah. And they go in there with John Woodruff and it's going to, we're going to, we're going to do this thing. Right. So the entire, the entirety of international management in the org, some of them for weeks, some of them went back right away, but some of them were there forever. And it, it was, it was crazy. It was, this is the only way they could actually try and get some expansion was having these top senior people come in and then they fired, then they had a mission that's only purpose was to recruit auditors and they did a very good job. I have to say, Kirsty Wilhair ran that and she recruited people and built up the auditors. And that was actually the part of the org that was most successful at that point because they had, but they weren't, they didn't need to sell any new auditing. They had this huge, tremendous backlog of people who'd paid for auditing and not gotten delivered to. So suddenly yeah. there were auditors to deliver that for a little while until they left and it started to fall apart like everything else. So the, I can say with full knowledge that that org was St. Hill size for one day, one week, one week. We had St. Hill size GI one week. The next week or one other week was close, but other than that, no, not even close. The, it just was all, it was all untrue. And then we found out, yeah, the bunch of false reporting was being done again because yet again, more pressure was being brought to bear than reality could handle, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that is, you know, I like the way you just put that. Mm -hmm. More pressure was brought to bear than reality could handle. And that is exactly Scientology's management style. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and if you want to know why Scientology staff members get them, get their heads into a headspace where they will be willing to bankrupt people, to take college funds, to to have people take out three or four or five credit cards beyond their ability to pay, or take out a second or a third mortgage on their house in order to finance more services or more things for Scientology, it's because of this pressure that's brought to bear on them to get numbers on a graph on a wall. Absolutely, same goes with recruitment, et cetera, and all of the, internal pressure that goes on for all of the what's really amounts to internal busy work you know exactly it's, and it's so all... so these staff are you know they don't just lounge around all day no. but, they, but they also don't do they seem to specialize in not doing the things that any business would do if it truly wanted to actually expand right but largely that's because they can't, because Scientology doesn't work, the management technology doesn't work. And 
it and they have to come up with all these unusual solutions and unusual ways. And plus, they're constantly getting cross orders. They're constantly getting being ordered to do this, that, the other thing, and 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 it changes all the time. And it's constant flow of just crazy, seemingly random orders coming from management into orgs because that's how it seems at the org at the you know org level is right. just and you know when you're at that level those staff members really they were afraid of people f at the clo level <laughs> which having been at various levels of the org yeah yeah you're a scary guy to these these people so you can imagine <laughs> what would, scary guy right yeah, here. scary guy so you can imagine what it would be like when cmo missions would come in i mean it was like people lived in fear in these orgs of that sort of stuff because it really was truly it was truly intimidating so right yeah exactly and that's and again these people are being driven into this so you know when you it's just a point of understanding the whole picture absolutely you know so the the, the at the at the org level at the local church level the LA or Mountain View you know Milano New York these 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 local orgs Mm -hmm. None of what they're doing, none of the pressure that, that they bring to bear on the public originates at that level. Right. It, it's coming down on them mm -hmm. at, with, with a tremendous degree of force. You know, and when Sea oh. Org members show up in an org, in a church, and are personally running this kind of thing on the staff, the pressure is amped up 10 times. Yeah, it's really intense because most you know at least the orgs that i've been to they're not like that you know they're not run that way they're not run the way sea org orgs are run of course and so every your everyday life is i don't want to say lackadaisical because that's the wrong picture but comparably lackadaisical compared to sea org you know that's right that's exactly right yeah. so you had so you saw wow so you had you know, genie then you had john woodruff Yes. And how long, so how long were you at LA work altogether? I was there for about three and a half years. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Which is a long time, by the way, I can tell you as a manager yeah. for a flag rep to be yeah. on a post. Yeah. In fact, they're not even supposed to be at orgs for that long. And and that's really for, because they're not supposed to fraternize with the locals. Oh, that's right. I forgot about all yeah. that. That's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's so, right. They're not supposed yeah. to fraternize that's another bad word in scientology fraternizing yeah. that's supposed to become friendly with the the staff because you're supposed to hate them right or you know, you're supposed to look down on them you're supposed to look down on them and you're supposed to re re realize one thing i missed was you know when i was at flag at the flag bureau level the the, the upper management level I'd never really had any experience with orgs other than as a brand new public had no idea what i was doing for two months the overriding impression that we were all given and we were all thought was that orgs were just full of off purpose meaning they weren't motivated to do the right things and they were all out ethics and they were all just you know a little bit of scum because they weren't sea org members right mm -hmm. and that was the attitude that the majority of people held when it came that's to orgs right. and i think that's important too because that's how they that was the attitude that came down to these, you know, these orgs, and it created this very toxic sort of environment. So that's how missions would come in, and I just I was very surprised to discover that was not the case. You know, they were really nice, and they were much easier and better to work with than, you know, than most your orgs I'd been in. Although I had actually been in some, you know, some good working, you know, teams and stuff. So it's not. But yeah, they were very, yeah, they were very nice. They were very hardworking. These people were working very, very hard, you know. So right. in many well, ways, basically. actually, they had it, in many ways, some had it harder because they did have to work a full-time job and then work a full-time post at the org. So they never had any chance to do anything. So. Exactly. Yeah. It was, it's, it's really a case of the ultimate hostile work environment. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You know, bring this into real world HR terms. Yeah. It, it would be hard to imagine a more hostile working environment than Scientology. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So then where did you go after you were done being a flag rep? How what, what happened and how where did you go to after that? 
Okay, what happened was in 1996, I got pregnant. Okay, that must yep. have been exciting. What happened there? Okay, so this was right around the time of the first Golden Age of Tech release, right? There was, um, in fact, my husband was working on that quite literally night and day. He wouldn't come home for days on end um, preparing for this, and he never got any sleep. He was getting zero to three hours of sleep at night for weeks. Um, because they were trying to prepare all of the materials for it. Wow. And of course, it was a last minute emergency, just like everything else. And um, I found out I was pregnant, and new management teams had just been sent in to um, the West US at that time. And in my first meeting with my new boss, I got to tell her that I was pregnant. And. <laughs> Now you're the flag rep of the most the, important model org in the yeah, world. I was the flag rep of, of one of the most important orgs and the flag rep network was very small at that point. There were very few. It had dwindled down to be quite small. So this was really bad news for her. Mm -hmm. I was no longer going to be able to be there. So she responded in kind. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, I say I'll never forget the look of shock, anger, disgust on her face. She was, she just immediately yelled at me. And just straight up, just like, no. Straight up, no just, that just immediately it was just bad. It went from like, hey, it's great to meet you. I'm so excited, to, you know, my new position to just, yeah, really anger. And um, she, she, very, you know, she was really angry and asked me, you know, why I wasn't just getting an abortion. And I... Just, just straight up, as though that was the yeah, expected... Like that was normal. Do. Yeah, like that was normal. And I had heard of that a couple of girls had gotten abortions in the Sea State, be able to stay in, and I'd seen a few, you know, have their kids and go out of the Sea right, to Class 5 org. So at that time, you would be sent to a Class 5 org if you had a kid. And uh, right, this is pre. This is this is about a year before the rule comes down of no more kids. Period. A few months before that rule. Months. Okay. Yeah, so this is so this is right before. Right, right before. So, um, so yeah, but it was nothing. You know, having abortions is nothing you ever talked about. So I did not know how prevalent it was, and. You know, so she she basically said to me, I you know that was what I should be doing was having an abortion to, so I could stay, and I told her, and I was very upset about that because there was no way that was going to happen. But I kind of knew that that was going to come up. I knew that I was going to be told that, which is ridiculous. You know, no mother should have to face this sort of thing. No person, no person should be you know should have to face this. So I you know I was ready for it. And I fought back and I was, you know, I had no problem speaking up if I felt something was very wrong. And so I did that. And uh, I told her and I used Dianetics to back me up in Science of Survival because Hubbard in those equates abortion to murder. Mm -hmm. And I don't personally believe that, but that was, it was, you know, easy to use to get her off my back about it. And so I was like, yeah, no, I'm having this baby. That's it. And that was actually the last time we talked about it. She didn't, you know, I wasn't on a, fortunately for me, I wasn't on a very, you know, I was, I was a flag rep. That's replaceable. I wasn't in CMO. I wasn't some executive because I think it, it would have been much worse based on everything I've read about women who have been put under intense pressure. So I was pretty lucky that I was just at a lowly class five org. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So what happened was, you know, the process started to get me replaced. And um, my husband actually was um, stopped by Hansuli Stolly in the, um, hallway at over at ITO and okay uh, so sorry yeah. but let's just explain oh, yeah, a little yeah. bit of that you just threw some okay, yeah. around there yeah. yes yeah. who is Hans Zuli Stalling 
Yep, sorry. He he works from he works at RTC, and I believe he's still there. He he is. He is right. Yeah. Yeah. And so he's that's the most RTC. senior. That guy's been in the RTC since the eighties. Right. Yeah. That's the most senior organization possible. And right. my husband was a was working at you know at the time actually I think he was a course admin because he'd been you know taken off of being a supervisor at you know international training org. So he was pretty much lower on the totem pole, and he was standing there. And his boss, who was the commanding officer for ITO, was also standing there. And the story that he told me many years later, we didn't talk about this at the time. I didn't tell him what had gone down in my meeting. He didn't tell me because you didn't talk about that sort of stuff, even with your spouse. And what, what occurred was Stali asked him what trimester I was in, not because he was curious, how far along I was, he wanted to see if I was still eligible to get an abortion. He just asked it casually in the hallway. Fortunately for my husband, the commanding officer of the Flag Command Bureau, which is um, higher, you know, not higher than RTC certainly, but a pretty high, you know, position yeah. was there and put a stop to that talk. Yeah, to his credit, he said, apparently he said, we're not going to go there. Interesting. So that is the only reason that he, because if he, if that guy hadn't been there, probably conversation would have gone very different because apparently the commanding officer of my, of his organization. So his boss's boss's boss helpfully filled in the details of what trimester I was in. And they were going to have some discussion, I guess, about getting me an abortion. So I didn't know about this until a few years ago. Wow. <laughs> So it creeps me out so much that that discussion happened and that these people thought this is an okay thing to talk about. Yeah, right out in the middle of the hallway. Right and in the hallway. the fact that some guy, like, literally, organizationally, five levels above you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Five levels, actually, no, five levels, like, above your husband. I mean, this yeah, is yeah, like yeah, very really high up. Yeah, yeah. Even knew about you. Yeah. And what was going on with you. Yeah. To ask in the hallway. Yeah. You know, to, to recognize your husband on site. Yeah. And go up to him and ask him this, you know, this yeah. fairly, you know, imposing question. <laughs> yeah. Right. From, and, and from altitude. I mean, RTC altitude, it doesn't get higher yeah. than that. Yeah. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, Just, yeah. tell me, That's like, great. what kind of organization is this that does this? What occurred after that? A replacement was was worked out, and I was going to go become the DSA of Mountain View Org, and yeah, I was going to replace the, the DSA, DSA oh, oh, Director of Special Affairs, and they're the person who locally handles the Office of Special Affairs stuff, so the public relations, media, government, intrigue, <laughs> etc. <cetera. laughs> right. Yeah. So, um, but meanwhile, I was still the flag rep at, at LA Day, and I was getting ever more pregnant, and it was known that I was pregnant, and that I was going off to a class, you know, going to, up to this other place, and uh, I would have to say that about half of the people I knew who were my friends or, you know, close acquaintances just, just completely stopped talking to me because I was pregnant, and I got... I overheard nasty comments, uh, got dirty looks. It became so bad that I would work really hard to avoid seeing other Sea Org members because I was just made to feel so ashamed and so, you know, like I was so in the wrong and betraying everybody. And <clears throat> so I would go to mealtimes like right at the end as everybody was rushing out. And I was able to do this only because I worked as the flag rep of this other org and had a slightly more flexible schedule. I didn't have to be at the same musters as all these other people. If I had to be in one of these other orgs, I have no idea what would have happened, how I would have fared. Because at, at LA at LA Today, it was mostly non-Sea Org, and they were mostly happy for me, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So if mm -hmm. I didn't have that balance, if I'd only been surrounded by all of this hate and disgust and, and you know, being shamed, I really don't know how well I would have come through it. 
Um, I would take showers at completely different times. I would, you know, all sorts of stuff. I would just do everything I could to just avoid running into people because it just became so painful to, you know, to do this. And I had to get myself on, there was no, obviously no health insurance. I had no money. Uh, California, fortunately, has a very good program for, you know, pregnant women who are low income. And I was able to get onto that. And I... Which, of course, is amazing that this would have to happen in Scientology, which we now know has billions of dollars in assets and reserves. Yeah, absolutely. But, but they can't I, deal with their pregnant members. No, no. And I had no... I, I think I... Ed, it's a stretch to say that I got one or two congratulations from other SEAL members. That's a stretch. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that didn't happen. Um, yeah, that's that's like being way kind about yeah, yeah. kind memories about what happened. Yeah, yeah, that's that's very kind. I had to organize, you know, getting myself I was twenty two at this point. I had to organize getting myself to and from my doctor's appointments. My husband was never able to come with me. In fact, he was not around very much at all because of all of the projects and stuff they were working on for the golden age of tech, golden age of management, etc. So I barely got to see him during that whole episode. Was it worth it though? <sighs> we're being interrupted. You're going to have to edit this out. Sorry. Yes, it was. <laughs> okay. So the, uh, in, in any case, yes, it was worth it. I, you know, I'm very glad that I, you know, stuck with my guns and, you know, had her. I wanted to be a mother. I did. I decided I wanted to be a mother. And, and um, but yeah, that just going through that, it was just, it, it, it sucked. You know, it really did. It was really hard to, um, you know, just dealing with all of the, tremendous negativity from everyone and um and i didn't get to really lessen my schedule much when i got further and further along i just kind of would go take naps occasionally mm. but i still had you know i was still working pretty long hours um at the time so but yeah it, it, i never saw my husband i never got any support i had to take care of it all on my own take the bus to the doctor you know, so I only went to the doctor a couple times because, you know, I couldn't get away that much. And uh, fortunately, I was young and healthy, and so it was fine. <laughs> it ended up being fine, but, you know, if there were any complications, it certainly wouldn't have been, you know, that good. Um, one of the things that happened while I was pregnant was um, when, I, when I was still at LA Day uh, and Woodruff was there, we were getting, we, we were having an argument because I was investigating him in relation to staff pay because he was um, messing around a little bit with how pay was being divided amongst the staff. And he got very angry, um, so much so that he was yelling really loudly at me. And I was about six months pregnant this time. And he pushed me against a wall and yelled, you know, got about two inches from my face, yelled, yelling at me really hard. So that was, yeah. <laughs> and Tom Woodruff was not a Sea Org member. He was not a SEER member, no. He was, you know, a was, public Scientologist. He was a staff member. Yeah. But had been a staff member for years. He had run Orange County Mission, yeah. turned it into an org, mm -hmm. and then they pulled him up to Los to Angeles. LA. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. 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 And he was considered, uh, you know, o he was OT8. Yep. He was highly trained. Yep. OT8. He was, he was an opinion leader. Pregnant women yeah. into walls. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's, he was so angry that he lost control. And he, he later apologized, but that happened. And, you know, that yeah. that he had such an anger issue that he did that was it was pretty crazy. So, yeah. It, yeah. it, it, it is inexcusable is what it is. Yeah, There's, sure. there, there is no excuse for, for sure. what he did. For sure. Unbelievable. Yep. So, um, what, so where did you end up having your baby in Los Angeles or did they get you up to Mountain View before that or I went up to Mountain View when I was about seven months along and um, by myself because my husband was not replaced yet so I went by myself I had almost no money like the, I wasn't given anything extra I had what you know little I had managed to we'd managed to save together and I had to get my own way up to Mountain View and everything. And I didn't know where where I was going to live, 
I had nothing. We had nothing at all. And the only reason things, yeah, nothing. We were given zero. And the not, only not even like any quarters set up. No, no. like this is where you're going. You're going to go yeah. be this DSA. So this yeah. is where you're going to live. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, nothing. I was expected that we'd just figure that out. And we were, again, we were very lucky that it was Mountain View we went to and they took care of us. The local org found a place for us to live, you know, made sure that, you know, we were okay. Yeah. Wow. That was it. Were they happy to see you when you got up there from having been an FR before and now you're the DSA? Yeah, they were. I think we got along really well. Yeah, they were pretty happy. I was pretty happy to see them because they were, at least there were people I knew. And at least it wasn't, you know, one of these just ridiculously tiny orgs that, you know, right. cause we had no idea how we were going to survive. And so, yeah, I felt very fortunate because I knew people who had gone out to some of these other orgs and it really did not go well at all. So, mm -hmm. yeah. No, we had, we certainly, we had about three or four couples in Santa Barbara when I was there. When you got to Mountain View, did, mm -hmm. was there a, uh, did they know you were coming? Yeah, they did. They did. Because okay, they knew so that they, the DSA was going to be joining the Sea Org. And, but apparently that deal wasn't totally done. So I had to kind of, I had to recruit her. I actually, she ended up not going. It, was, it ended up being somebody else. And I helped work out a replacement for that guy with her and at another org at Stevens Creek. And it was just another one of those weird sort of things. And yeah, that was when I was actually threatened if I didn't get that done that, um, my, that my my the flag rep for West US would send me to work under Jeannie Sonnenfeld, who by this time was had had a baby. She was pregnant about the same time as me and had been sent to be the ED of an org. And Cincinnati. she Yeah, Cincinnati, that's right. Yeah. And I was threatened I was threatened with being sent out to her because she knew exactly how much Jeannie hated me and how much I hated Jeannie and how badly that would go. And so it lit a fire under me to make sure, <laughs> you know what I mean? It was like, it was crazy. So I was seven months pregnant. I was, I was somewhere I'd never been, didn't know. I was kind of, I was actually staying with um, the staff member of uh, Stevens Creek Org at the time for a few days and kind of bouncing around for the first few weeks while this got all, while I helped get this all sorted out and then finally landed at a you know proper place in Mountain View, yeah, yeah. Wow! Yeah. So it's basically the kindness of strangers and staff. Yes. Only. That that got you settled in. The Sea Org did absolutely nothing except threaten you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's seven yeah. months, seven months pregnant. Yeah, yeah. It was it was a really intense sort of time. <laughs> wow! So. And meanwhile, your husband's being held hostage down at ITO because. Not They're because not he wants to stay there, right, right, but because right. he's not replaced. Right. And exactly. so they're holding him there and yeah. send a single, you know, pregnant mother up yeah. to go make it go right and deal with all this. Pretty much. And the only reason I was able to actually get up there before I had my baby, because there was no way I wanted to have a baby in Sea Org quarters. Oh, no. So the only way that happened was I had actually worked out a transfer of funds from Albuquerque from my dad because he had, had like a couple hours of auditing on account over to LA day to pay for my own sec check because I had to get a sec check before I could leave to go up to You're Mountain. Kidding. No, not kidding at all. You had to pay for your own sec check so you could go. Yeah. Cause otherwise it was never going to happen. And I was going to have my baby in Sea Org dorms. I, you know, I don't know why things like this continue to surprise me. I keep saying this. I don't know why this kind of stuff surprises me, but the, 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 the bottom net, there's no bottom. It, it never comes. The, the depths to which these people will go, it, it just, I mean, I never heard of any of this stuff. When, when I was in, I was right across the street yeah. from you while yeah. this was happening, yeah. you, you know, doing the Golden Age of Tech thing. Yeah. I never heard word one about any of this. Yeah, because it didn't matter to anybody. Well, I'm, no, my I'm saying, it wasn't even yeah. on my radar. I'm just saying yeah. I didn't have a clue yeah. that any yeah. of this, that you would have had to pay for your own. I mean, it just, yeah. you know, that's yeah. just outrageous. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's outrageous. But it was the only, it was the only thing. And, and I knew I had to make it go right. Right. right? Had to make right. it happen because otherwise, you know, that, that was going to happen. And, 
I, um, I have to ask just because you know I, I do know this sort of thing went down yeah. and I'm curious if it happened with you guys <laughs> did somebody besides that hallway conversation with uh, Stolly with Hanzuli Stolly did anybody else over at ITO or otherwise ever sit your husband down did he ever tell you they tried to convince him to divorce you or stay and you know you just go off and deal with it no he didn't really say he had those kind of conversations so I mean like I said I didn't even know about the thing that happened with Stolly until a few years ago because you just kind of didn't talk about that sort of stuff um, I think he was really lucky because he was again he was a course admin and he was really low you know he was not considered a big you know resource or anything and he already wasn't doing that well so you know which which okay yeah. good so you know I do know that those conversations did occur with other couples I'm glad yeah. it didn't happen with you guys or at least you don't know it also again you know speaks volumes about Scientology and the Sea Organ that you get replaced you get sent out on what is no inarguably a harder post to replace the flag wrap of you yeah. Yeah. And him being some course admin, some, that we're talking about a yeah. low post, yeah. like yeah. nobody cares yeah. about it, right? Yeah. Exactly. And I think yeah. and they hold on to him. Right. Yeah. He. This is what happened. He he was trying to get out of there. He was told he needed to recruit his own replacement, which is hundred percent impossible. You, you you're not around people. There's no public to recruit no over public there. To recruit. Yeah. Yeah. That's what he was told. So he's put into this impossible situation. <laughs> It's only because of Marriott Lindstein that he got to be there for the birth of his own child. Wow. She ordered that he be released about three weeks before I was due. And Marriott Lindstein is out of the Sea Org and out of Scientology now. I know. Yep. But it's Just only saying. because of her. I know. And it's only because of her. Otherwise, he would have missed the birth of his own child and I would have had to have, have her without my own husband being there to help me so well yeah yeah, yeah. that family every every time you know anybody who's watching this yeah when you see Scientology say family values this is what they're talking about yep absolutely